sin. Romans 3 and verse 23. In the Old Testament, in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Consequently, all deserve death. So Paul concluded to the Romans in Romans 6 verse 23. And following death, physical death, Eternal judgment in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 20, 12 through 13. For if God gave us exactly what we deserve, we would all be, right now, condemned throughout eternity. Now, with that in mind, Every day we live is an act of God's mercy. Peter, in writing to Christians, said that time goes on giving men a chance to participate and to enjoy God's mercy through His grace. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, that is, to return. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long-suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When David had committed such heinous sins, although really a sin is a sin, as far as it's separating man from God. In Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2, a part of his prayer for forgiveness, listen to him as he cries out, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Here is a plea to God for mercy. He wants judgment that he deserves to be withheld from him. Instead, he wants forgiveness of God for his sins against God. He cannot do anything to obligate God to forgive him of his sins. He doesn't merit this at all. Mercy is extended to a guilty person who is at fault. And that needs to be kept in mind. And with this, I would like for us to begin a study of mercy and grace. Let's remember that we deserve nothing from God. I think sometimes we get the idea that how could God get along without us? God needs nothing. God is God and complete in His very being. God does not owe us anything. Paul, in reminding the church at Ephesus how those Gentile members were before the gospel got to them and they understood it, believed it, and obeyed it, reminded them of their state of affairs before God and before they became Christians. And he says in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, And you hath he quickened, that means spiritually made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, that is our conduct and manner of life, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, 
even as others. Now the Calvinist would look at the word nature here and see that he was that he's saying they were born in sin, having inherited it from Adam. But that's not the way it's used here. They were doing by nature that which was sinful because generation after generation after generation had done it. You can read Romans 1 and see how that the Gentiles departed from God and what God gave them over to doing. Then he says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. God is love. It produces his mercy, which gives us his favor, his grace. We don't deserve any of that. He goes on to say, beginning in verse 5, Even when we were dead, separated, in sins, by sins, our transgressions of his will, hath quickened or made alive us together with Christ. Then he says, By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Remember earlier in the preceding first chapter in verse 3. That all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. And I echoes that same sentiment again. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Where? In Christ Jesus. For what purpose? That in the ages to come... He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. What's the avenue? Through Jesus Christ. We are God's trophy, and that's what he's saying. He's going to put us on trophy case. And so you see, we, even as we labor to be faithful and thereby acceptable to God through adherence to the doctrine that comes from his grace, the gospel, we are actually striving in this system of salvation to call the faith for which we are to contend, Jude 3, to find a place on the trophy case of God. For by grace are ye saved through, there's the avenue, faith, and that not of yourselves, there's nothing you can do about it. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Well, now you've got to harmonize that, James chapter 2. Same Holy Spirit that guided Paul, guided James, and those scriptures harmonize. So what's he talking about works here? Not the same works he's talking about in James 2. Those works are works of obedience to the gospel and works of obedience that Christians ought to practice. And he would tell us over in James 2 that faith without works is dead. But he says here, not of works. What does he mean? Any meritorious works we think we can do to obligate God to pay us for salvation, you can't be saved by those kind of works. Because you could boast about them, and he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's not a thing in the world that a true Christian can boast about. All of his obedience is nothing more than expressing his faith in, in God and his system of salvation and his love of God for doing it. There has to be a way for a free moral agent to receive what is freely given to him. And we do that when, by faith, which comes by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, we comply with his terms of pardon. For we are his workmanship. Who made us what we are? Remember what I was talking about last week, a new creature in Christ? A creature is a created thing. Who created us? Who made us Christians? And he didn't do it without our cooperation. Because God is the author of eternal salvation and do all of them that obey him. And it's that kind of work that he's really rebuking the people James writes to in James 2. Because they thought they could say, well, I believe Christ is the Son of God. He saved me and sat down and do nothing. But there are things that manifest our faith in God for us who are members of the church and have been saved by grace through an obedient faith. For we are his workmanship created where? In Christ Jesus. For what purpose? Unto, to give an end, good works. We became Christians to be involved in good works, and their good works is the New Testament to find good works, not as we think they should be. And notice, which God hath before ordained, appointed, that we should walk in them. Now, what's happening in James 2 is that they were walking in them. They weren't doing what the Lord said Christians are to do. They said, well, we obeyed the gospel, and then rather than stand on the promises, we just plopped down on the premises. It's exactly what we did. 
That's the reason we need to sing songs about we'll work till Jesus comes. Will we? Because when we say that, we're adhering to what James says you ought to be doing as a Christian. We are his workmanship created for good works. Well, what a thought that is. There is a wealth of information there concerning being saved by grace through an obedient faith and the difference in meritorious works which will not save us and works of faith which are obedience to his will so that we can be saved and he is the author of eternal salvation and to all of them that obey him. And that's what James is talking about when he says faith without works, works of obedience, is dead. Now I want us to look at several scriptures that tie into this. Think about them. And that really will be the rest of the sermon. First of all, just going through the New Testament, I'll begin in Acts, and looking at mercy and grace and what the Bible teaches about it, because we cannot go to heaven without God's mercy and God's favor. We find in Acts 14.3, on the first preaching tour of Paul and Barnabas, long time therefore, Abode they, now listen, speaking boldly, now look, in the Lord. Did we hear anything about in the Lord from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10? We did. Boldly in the Lord. Notice what they did, because he's an apostle. He can give testimony, which gave testimony, but testimony to what? Under the word of his grace. Well, how did they do that? And granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The miracle signs and wonders confirmed that what Paul preached came from heaven, not from men. It was given by revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's the word of his grace. Think about that for a minute. The word's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. It's by that word faith in God and godly things is created in Romans 10, 17. And yet it's the word of his grace. God's favor gave us a Bible. I don't know of any greater example in our hands now that evidences how we have been favored and we don't deserve it other than the mercy of God that gave us the Bible for all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Given by inspiration of God. And then he tells us, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means spiritually complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now, what do we learn over there? We're created unto good works. It's the scriptures that tell us what works God calls good. So even when we do what God requires of us as Christians, whose work is being done? Why, well, God's work's being done. Listen further, Acts 15, 11. This is where they're in Jerusalem, gone there to get together with the church in Jerusalem and find out where this false doctrine came from. Because remember, certain ones came down from Jerusalem and taught the brethren of Antioch, except you be circumcised, keep the law, you can't be saved. And Paul and Barnabas really had a debate with them right there. Paul didn't need to go up to Jerusalem and learn what the truth was. Paul was an apostle. Do you remember this morning in the reading that he declared that it was by revelation? He didn't go up to Jerusalem with those apostles before him. But it was by revelation that he got what he got. He already knew right and wrong on the matter of, of who was right and who was wrong when those folks came from Jerusalem. What they went to Jerusalem for in Acts 15 was to find out who started this business. You don't think the church is qualified and ordained and obligated to find out where doctrines come from and who does what and when? Well, there it is. Been out there in your Bible all along. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Now, he's talking about you Jews who are saved or saved by grace. Same gospel that's preached to these Gentiles, the gospel of his grace. Remember that he talked about the word of his grace? Well, what did they preach in Antioch? The word of his grace. The word that declared how God has had mercy on you out of his love and has offered you salvation by his favor, by his grace. And thus, the gospel is called the word of his grace. And he says, we shall be saved, even as they. In other words, there's no gospel for the Gentile, and it's different from the gospel of the Jew. There is one single solitary gospel. So what does Paul say in Romans 1.16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation. Well, we go further, and we look over in Acts 18, verse 27. 
They're out here proclaiming Christ and crucified, traveling all over the place. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, that is Paul, at southern Greece, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, now listen, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. Acts 18, 27 again. Well, we know how they believe through grace because, remember, they preach the word of his grace. And it's the word that creates saving faith in a person, Romans 10, 17. And it's that saving faith that must reach a point of obedience before it will save you, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. So, they believe through grace. Now, you put these scriptures together, you don't isolate them and say everything one needs to know about grace is this one verse. You need to look at these words and how they're used by God as he wrote part of the New Testament and how they were doing what they did in spreading the gospel in the first century. But we go to Acts 20 and verse 24. Paul declares concerning all sorts of problems, he says, but none of these things move me. If your faith in Christ built by the word of God, the word of his grace is not strong enough to where the things of men don't move you it needs to be notice how far he had gone in his love of God and faith in God neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus now watch what was it Paul to testify the gospel of the grace of God well Paul said the gospel is the power of God to save but we're saved by grace. And he preached the word of his grace. He preached the gospel. And the gospel of the grace of God is just that. When you preach the gospel to somebody, that's God's favor being presented to people as it concerns how to be saved and how to live the Christian life. The gospel of the grace of God. Do you remember how many times we have said, don't run over little phrases and little words? We're just looking at mercy and grace and such things as that. Yet look how the Holy Spirit used them through these writers. We read this, no telling how many times if you're a student of the Bible. But we go further to chapter 20 and verse 32. There Paul's addressing the Ephesian elders that he has called to Miletus as he's in a hurry to go to Jerusalem. And notice what he says to those elders. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. Well, how did he do that? And to the word of his grace. You can't commend somebody to God and not commend them to the word of His grace because without the word of His favor, you can't know anything about God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. No wonder then these common passages, as you tie them into these things properly, that James would also say in James 1, 25, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Well, look how those go. Have we mentioned work before? But a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Why is he blessed in his deed? Because he's abiding by the word of God's favor. Why? Because that lets him know about God. What does that tell him? It lets him know about how to become a Christian. What does that tell him? It lets him know how to live in the church doing good works. All of it ties together. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. What does it do which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Well, that's the church. How do you become a saint? By belief and obedience from the heart to the gospel of Christ, Romans 6, 17 and 18. How are you set apart, suitable for the master's service? Set apart to good works as the Bible tells us what those good works are. Why, it's through the word of God. That's why Paul said preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap it to themselves, teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. Turned away from the word of his grace unto something that's different. He calls it a fable. But to be a saint, you have to listen to the word that sanctifies, the word of his grace. In Romans 5.21, Paul says to the church at Rome that as sin hath reigned, that means like a king ruling over his kingdom, as sin hath reigned unto death, unto, in order to a given point. How far did sin go? Why, it separates you from God. 
Now think about this. We've said it often, but we need to keep it on our minds. There's not a thing existent that can separate you from God but your sins against God. Should not be therefore grounds enough to be as concerned about that as you can be concerned about anything. So that as sin hath reigned unto death, because he's writing to the church, even so, might grace reign or rule. How? Through righteousness. To what end? Unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What is he saying? What's he telling us? Grace cannot, God's grace that saves us, cannot benefit you or me or anybody else if it doesn't have an avenue to get from heaven to men. Now do you understand better why Paul, why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Why? The gospel is the power of God to save. It's the word of his grace. Paul said, preach the word. People can't be saved without the gospel because that's how God's grace reaches people. Yes, his grace reaches us, but not without the gospel. Then we read, too, in Galatians 1, 6. Remember, they were being troubled, the churches of Galatia, by those that said, you Gentiles must be circumcised to keep the law. And Paul is really on their case. And he's saying, you are amazing me. I marvel that ye are so, not because you departed, but so soon after you heard the truth. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Unto another gospel, in the Greek, a gospel of a different kind than what I preach to you. That's basically what he's saying. Because that gospel of a different kind was one that said, now, for Gentiles, you must not only believe, repent, confess your faith in Christ and be baptized, but you must be circumcised to keep the law. And that's the wrong kind of gospel. It was the one Paul preached to them. And that's why he goes on a little, a little later and says, The gospel I preached, I received by revelation of Jesus Christ. And you know I did because I worked signs and miracles to prove it came from heaven and not from men. But he was amazed that they departed so quickly. But notice how they were called into the grace of Christ. It was by the gospel. Nobody can participate or benefit from the mercy and grace of God without the gospel of his grace, which no wonder Paul called the power of God to save us. In Galatians 1.15, notice as he argues for his apostleship and defends the gospel he preached. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Galatians 1.15, well, how was he called by his grace? Well, he saw Christ. No, that wasn't way he was called by his grace. He saw the resurrected Christ for one reason, one reason only, to be an apostle of Christ. He could actually testify to people that I have seen the risen Lord. He'll ask that question at one place. Have I not seen Christ? Well, then how was he called by God's grace? The gospel, by God's wisdom, has been placed in the hands of the church. It's the church that is commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Thus, Christ had appeared to the teacher of Paul, the preacher of the gospel, Ananias, and told him, you go into the city to a street called Straight. And there's one there waiting on you. He's told. He's been told to wait there on you. But notice Christ in appearing to Paul never told him a thing about what to do to be saved. Nothing. It's in the hands of men. We, as the spiritual body of Christ, are in cooperation with God in the spreading of the gospel of God's grace. So when Ananias came, he sees a believing, repentant person who's fasting for three days and he's blind. And it's quite obvious it doesn't take a genius to figure out that this man has had a tremendous change. Because remember what Ananias said to the Lord when the Lord first appeared to him? He didn't want to go. We hear about this man. He had a reputation. He's done much violence to the church. And now he's come here to arrest Christians, take them back to Jerusalem. Well, you notice the Lord doesn't argue with him. He said, get up and go do what I told you. And that's basically what he said. I've told you to do this. Get up and go do it. I, I wish sometimes in your own studies of the Bible to go back through the Old Testament and note how many times 
that you'll have a prophet want to kind of say, well, no, wait a minute. Remember Moses? He couldn't do this. He couldn't do that. God just tells him, go do what I told you to do. And he argues, go do what I told you to do. And he says, well, I don't know. And he says, go do what I told you to do. And some people even head off trying to get away from God, going one end of the Mediterranean to the other, the other one, like Jonah. And after he put him through all that mess and he's burped out on the beach, go do what I told you to do. And that ought to tell us something, that when we read the Word of God, God means what he says, says what he means. He's not going to change. And he expects us as Christians to know what those good works are that Christians ought to do, that God's word of his grace has told us, and we ought to be active in it. So he called me by his favor, by his grace. And thus, when this Ananias, the teacher who the Lord sent to him to tell him what to do to be saved, saw he was a believer, and by his life, it's evidence he's repented, he said, well, now why? Why, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sin." Calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord means that you call on his name. You appeal to his authority to save you by obeying him, which is being as a believer and penitent, one who needs to be baptized to Christ. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord, to appeal to his authority. That's what Peter said in Acts 2, verse 38. To those who were believers, he took them as believers and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. But let's go further to the Colossians, Colossians 1, 6. Talks about the gospel that saves us. And he says, which is coming to you, you people in Colossae who heard, believed, and obeyed it. Now watch as it is in all the world. And it brings forth fruit. The gospel will not bring forth the fruit God wants it to bring forth until the people hearing it understand it and fully obey it. The same is true about the work of the church and the word of his grace for those of us to live like the Bible says. It, the church will never do what God said do till we do what God says the church is to do. So which is coming to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Colossians 1, 6. Do you remember Jesus said? I know we remember. We quote it too often. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And here Paul says, the grace of God in truth. If you don't know the truth of the gospel, you can't know the grace of God and how it reaches you and how to live in the church or even how to become a member of it. We read further from Titus 2, 11 and 12. Remember, he's a preacher. He's a member of the church. He needs to preach these truths. So for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, this is summing up really everything we've said. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation, notice, hath already, past tense, appeared to all men. Who do you think that was? Since it's past tense. Well, you remember John 1? And the Word became flesh. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus Christ. Now watch, the grace of God came teaching. These people who teach you say, but grace only. They don't understand salvation by grace through an obedient faith. Is grace important? There's no way to underestimate how important grace is. But watch. The Bible teaches God saves us, Christ saves us, the Holy Spirit saves us, the Bible saves us, the blood of Christ saves us. And you even have a part in your salvation. If you read what is said there when the church started in Acts chapter 2 and Peter's sermon, he makes it very clear in what Luke records that they were to work out their own salvation. And you're told later on concerning living the Christian life, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is, you take the truth that's the same to everybody and you apply it to you. And under all things you undergo and do, you make sure you abide in the truth. If you must divest yourself of this because you're weak in that area in order to abide in the truth, you divest yourself of it. 
Each one of us has different things that might be more appealing to us than it might to others. It's interesting that Paul told Timothy that he ought to avoid youthful lust. Well, I never did read in the Bible where he said that old folks ought to avoid old folks' lusts. But the idea is there. There are things at different stages of life that will appeal to you that won't in other stages of life. And you can't let the devil lose, use any of them to get you to violate God's will. Now, that's very important. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now watch. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, whatever form it takes, however it comes, and worldly lust, that involve the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. There's no second chance, folks, in this present world. Titus 2, 11 and 12. We have one time in the flesh to go through this world. For some people, they never get out of childhood. Some never get out of adolescence. Some never get out of their 20s. Some go to past 100. But however long you're here and accountable to God, you're expected to find God, learn the truth, and abide by it according to the word of His grace. Because that's the only time you have. You don't have any other time. We have now. That's in Titus 2, 11 and 12, that we should live righteously, soberly, godly, in this present world. Or any doctrine comes along and says there's a second chance. No. This is it. You have one life to live. To prove to God you love him with all that you have and are. You love your neighbor yourself. And you love the truth and you'll obey it. And nothing will remove you from it. And that's what life in Christ is all about. In 1 Peter 1.10. Notice as he writes about the gospel system of salvation. That God in his infinite wisdom formed. And the people under the Old Testament couldn't figure it out. How does a just God save sinful people when perfect justice says punish them of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently because here's what they were doing when you read the prophecies of the Old Testament you just note this what were they doing who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you you who Christians that's what he was saying Peter was in this passage 1 Peter 1.10 all through the Old Testament as the great scheme of redemption unfolded down to the ages. And the prophets wrote about part of it. They were trying to figure this thing out with what they had. But they couldn't do it until the New Testament. And thus you have somebody like the Ethiopian eunuch who was devout, had been up to Jerusalem, worship, was returning again. And he's reading in the Bible. Philip's been called away from a very profitable and successful preaching of the gospel in Samaria until you go down there. And then he's told by the Holy Spirit to join himself with that chariot. And as he approaches the chariot, the prophet's reading. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he didn't. He was honest, wasn't he? How dare anybody ask me if I don't understand some portion of the Bible. Very ideal. I've been to Jerusalem to worship. I'm devout. Well, he didn't. And we know it was Isaiah 53. And he says, well, who, who, who's the prophet talking about here? Himself or some other person? And Philip began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. You will never know until you get to the revelation of the New Testament how God's going to save people just from your knowledge of the Old Testament. You can't do it. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And thus he went on his way rejoicing, for he heard the gospel of grace. Faith was formed. And he said, see, here, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? He said, well, if I believe it's all thine heart, thou mayest. He stopped the chariot. They both went down the water. Philip baptized him. They came up out of the water. Spirit caught away Philip. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing. One more scripture, 2 Peter 3, 18. And it affects us all as any time we're on this earth. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Second Peter 3.18. So we can grow in this favor. 
We can show forth Christ living in us as we apply the gospel of his grace, the word of his grace, and we submit to it. We must submit our wills and desires to the will and desires of our Lord. But we can't know what they are if we don't spend time with the Bible. The most valuable time any of us can spend on this earth is time with the Bible where we diligently study it and time in prayer to God. However much you're spending in your time, of your time in studying the Bible, however much time you're spending in prayer to the Almighty, you can spend more. And how could you want to spend less? So if you're not a child of God, we beg you to believe with all your heart in the light of the teaching of the Scriptures that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, and upon that faith in Christ, repent of your sins as commanded, Acts 17.30. And confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, verse 10. And be buried with your Lord in baptism according to the word of His grace. And be saved by His grace through an obedient faith. Raised to walk in newness of life, you're added to the church by the Lord. And you walk by faith and not by sight. As a child of God, have you forgotten these fundamental matters, these first principles of the gospel? Have you sinned? Do you need to repent? You need to pray God for forgiveness, having confessed those sins. That's God's second law of pardon. And if you need to do that, we urge you to do it, and to do it now while we stand and while we sing.